dancing Everything gonna be all right Everything's going to be all right. It's a beautiful Friday up on the mountain. It's good day wherever you're listening from, and welcome to Indoor Air Quality Radio. It's IAQ Radio, Friday, March 11th, 2016. This week is episode 405. My name is Radio Joe Hughes, and uh, remote running things is John. You got to have faith, our engineer. And joining me from Studio C in McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania, is Cliff, the Z-Man Zlotnick. Hey, Joe. Hi, John. Hey, guests. Hello, everybody. Good day, Cliff. Okay, this week we've got a great show lined up. We've got two Ph.D. doctors and uh, the COO of Detection Tech, Matt Coghill, Dr. Mark Hernandez, and Dr. Joe Boatman. We're going to talk a little bit about some interesting technology with respect to assessment of indoor environments and indoor bioaerosols. So we'll be right with that. But before we do, let's stop and thank our marquee sponsors. And thanks to our newest sponsor, Particles Plus. Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers feature-rich particle counters, air quality monitoring instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. Learn more at www.particlesplus.com. Count on us. John Don Products, or restoration and abatement contractor shop. Visit them at johndon.com. Clean Facts, the number one information source for cleaning and restoration professionals. Check them out at cleanfacts with an X.com. IAQ.net and Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at IAQ.net. Please be sure to thank our sponsors for their support of IAQ Radio when you acquire about their products or services. Okay, and last but not least, please visit the IAQ Training Institute website for the most current dates for the training you trust at IAQtraining.com. Let's turn it over to the Z-Man for today's IAQ Radio trivia question. Thanks, Joe. Win a cool prize by outcompeting fellow IEQ radio listeners and being the first person to correctly answer the IEQ radio trivia question each week. Submitting your answer is very easy. Either email it to cslotnick at cs.com, or if you're listening to the show live, you can text in the answer via your computer. Congratulations. Brian Baker, Custom Vac Limited, Winnipeg, Manitoba, for the first correct answer to last week's trivia question. The IQ Radio trivia question for Friday, March 11, 2016, has been sponsored by Ideas LLC, the solution chemistry company, creating unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Now for this week's IQ Radio trivia question. This apparatus is used for recording and measuring spectra, especially as a method of analysis. Name it. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Cliff. Okay, today's guests, we've got Dr. Mark Hernandez. His degrees and uh, postdoctoral tenure were in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at the University of California at Berkeley. After several years of civil engineering practice, he joined the University of Colorado faculty in 1996, where he is now a full professor. Dr. Hernandez is a registered professional engineer and an expert on the quantitation and remediation of bioaerosols. A generation of his research lies in characterizing the biological aspects of air pollution, both indoors and out. We've also got Dr. Joe Boatman. He is the uh, principal at Indoor and Outdoor Air Quality Consulting. His Ph.D. is from the University of Wyoming, where he majored in atmospheric research. He is uh, very experienced in atmospheric aerosols, atmospheric physics, and meteorology. 
And last but not least, we've got Matt Coghill. Matt is currently serving as the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Detection Tech Holdings. Matt has, uh, he led the development of the Instascope real-time bioaerosol detection technology from its inception in 2012. He is currently trying to translate that complex science and technology experience of his team into a product that is accessible and compelling to the non-technical consumer. And I believe the team is all here today, or a big important part of the team, and uh, we have some music for our guests. All right, Inspector Gadget, I think that's appropriate for this show. Let's start with you, Matt. Um, talk to us a little bit about the, uh, what is it, Insta, uh, I already messed up the name, InstaCheck uh, Detection Tech yeah. Technology. Yeah, so thanks, Joe. Uh, really happy to be here. Uh, the InstaScope, we named it that actually because uh, Dr. Hernandez and I were sitting around one day and he said, you know, it's, it's really like an instant microscope. Uh, and that's effectively what the technology is designed to do, is to uh, determine uh, the load and relative composition of airborne biology uh, for the purposes of indoor environmental quality investigation. So uh, we, we call it the Instascope, and we use it to uh, qualify, you know, I say it to the average customer, qualify what's in the air that you're breathing. I'm curious now... Your team is with you, I, I assume. Am I? Is that accurate? You are right. We've got Dr. Uh, Fernandez and uh, Dr. Boatman, who, if it's okay with them, we'll just call Mark and Joe from here on. Okay, that works for me, um, gentlemen. I'm I'm curious how what what led to the development of this. I don't know who who would take this on, but what led to the development of this Instascope? So this is uh, uh, originally a military. Uh, technology um, that's crossed over into the civilian sector. Um, as you know, unfortunately, there are um, avenues for biological warfare now. Some of those are um, through the aerosol route. So this technology was originally developed to count size um, and identify airborne biological warfare agents. It's been since improved, adopted, and crossed over into the military sector to be applied to um, all aerosols, whether they be outdoors or indoors, um, and uh, to help characterize them, uh, particularly in uh, the air quality sector, and as a useful tool for assessing uh, remediation efforts. And that was, Dr. Hernandez, was that you? Yes, sir. Okay, great. I want to try and keep things straight for our guests. And then, um, Dr. Boatman. What was your role in in this uh, development of this and moving it toward uh, the you know the private sector? Well, they came to me a few a couple of years ago and asked me if I would act as a prototyping person since I do a lot of practical indoor air quality testing for people in their homes and uh, businesses, and knowing that the existing technology has some shortcomings. I was more than anxious to give that a try and see if the new technology could be something that I would be wanting to continue to use. Well, let me kind of describe this for listeners since we've got to paint a picture on the radio here. It's a, it's like a, a little box on wheels, a cart essentially with an iPad connected to it or a screen, and then you've got what looks like a, you know, a, a standard type of particle counter um, out, coming off the top so you're, you're drawing air through here and um, you're getting an immediate or fairly immediate readout on, on what's in the air. I know when I saw it recently in, in southern Florida you had temperature and relative humidity and then I think it was PM 2.5 and PM 10 plus some bioaerosol breakdown. Is that somewhat what we're talking about here? Let's, let's, let's go back uh, to Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Instascope 
the the easy stuff is the temperature and the relative humidity and the the basic particle loads, which we we segregate into PM two point five and PM ten, just so we can reference the EPA NAQUIS uh, standard. Um, but the real thing that sets the Instascope apart is uh, we can't uh, we don't only tell you how many, but we tell you what kind, uh, and we do that on the fly. Uh, so the instrument, like you said, some people call it R two D two. It's uh, pretty much equivalent to a uh, piece of rolling luggage, if you kind of think about that from size. And uh, what the data points that really come out, in, this, in addition to the particles and the temperature and humidity, is uh, right now uh, we've limited the output to the, uh, the mold uh, concentration and uh, then relative composition. We can get into that in a second. Uh, we also have the ability to uh, indicate uh, bacteria and pollen, but we haven't put that in the report uh, yet. Um, although that's that's in the future plans. And just to clarify for listeners, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards is what you were referring to with respect to the outdoor um, levels for EPA with PM two point five and PM ten. That's right. Yeah, we're we're trying to give uh, context to indoor particle loads just by referencing a standard. Okay, and now maybe one of the uh, one of the doctors. Let's let's go with Doctor Hernandez. Can you explain a little better how the Instascope differentiates between particles, whether they are, uh, they could be asbestos fibers, they could be any number of things, and then um, biological, particles of biological origin, and then maybe we'll go into a little more detail on going from just biological origin to differentiating between mold and bacteria. I know there's a central um, focus within the, the unit that, I guess, the central technology that helps to do that. Sure, um, and, and you you got to the to the heart of the difference here is um, uh, particles of biological origin, whether it be bacteria, pollen, or fungi, have a characteristic size and shape with respect to other particles, and um, part of the magic of biology is the things that comprise microbial cells, some of them at least, proteins, genetic material, and so on, which are unique to biology, have fluorescence properties uh, as opposed to their inorganic uh, counterparts, some of which have fluorescence properties, but typically not the same as biology. So, for instance, you chose, as an example, as as asbestos fibers, and um, by virtue of the name fiber, that speaks to its aspect ratio, right? It's long compared to its width. It has a characteristic shape. Um, it, it reflects light in a certain way. And all those things are put together in an algorithm to size, shape, and reflection, all those factors, um, and its fluorescence characteristics and what we've done essentially is comprise a pretty broad library of more than 50 common bacteria, fungi, and pollens, and we reference the characteristics of size, shape, and the way that they fluoresce when they're in um, this instrument in real time to be able to say with some high probability that, hey, this is a particle that's likely of biological origin, and if it has the characteristics of a fungi, the right size, the right shape, and the right fluorescence reflection properties, we count it as a fungi. If it doesn't, we don't. It, it's separated out, and then we look at the ratios of the total particle load, that is all the particle particles counted, in a certain size range, whether it be 2.5 or larger, PM10, for instance. We can separate them out by size and by optical properties, and we can get the ratios of the total particle loads in a certain size range to those that have biological qualities as reference to a large library. So... Um, what we've done here at the University of Colorado is we have a very large bioaerosol chamber where we can control the humidity and temperature. We aerosolize known biological agents. That's the expertise in my lab. And we let the Instascope do what it does, count them w and sort them. And then we use that library as a reference when we actually use it in a house or in the um, environment at large. So that's kind of how it works. And how... Hey, Joe. Go ahead. Joe, do you mind if I... I I'm going to... That, that was a very well-crafted explanation. I'm going to uh, take it down uh, just and, and say that the simpler version that I, I often say to folks is that 
in the biofluorescence uh, piece of the instrument, basically the principle is that if you uh, hit a particle with invisible light, based on what the particle is made out of, it will come back to you as visible light. And then we can look at that light and we can say what color is it, how much intensity is that light, and how big and what, what size and shape is the particle. And those are the characteristics that allow us to distinguish uh, between particles. We liken it to uh, red, green, and blue on your TV set, RGB. And like a you know, standard TV, you have three channels in this particular uh, device, the configuration of the instroscope, and you get signals in all channels or one or any combination thereof, and that corresponds um, to a reference set that we've done in the lab, and that helps us understand if it's a biological particle, bacteria, fungi, uh, or pollen, or not, and we count it that way. And how... Let's let's kind of give people some uh, concrete examples and then get a comparison on how... Uh, how specific the, the analysis is. So we're talking about, as I understand it, not you're not quite, you know, you're not to the level of DNA analysis like with the Army uh, or MS, uh, QPCR, uh, uh, but you're, you're kind of uh, at the level of maybe a, a micro, microscopist in, in a lab, or are you somewhere between those two? Um, I think... What this is, as the name says, is it's an instant microscope. It is exactly how we look at um, at uh, biology, you know, aerobiology in the lab. We collect particles um, and put them on a slide and look at them under an ultraviolet microscope. That's what it is in this case. So we're looking at reflected light of different colors and looking at size and shape and so on, intensity, as Matt just mentioned. So it's probably closer uh, to... Uh, the microscopist certainly than it is the genetic material. We're not extracting any genetic material. We're not sequencing here. But um, this phenotypic information is very helpful. And what we found is um, that this can process a lot more particles than any microscopist could. We can get a lot bigger sample size. It can do so on a composite basis, meaning we get a time integrated sample instead of a grab sample. Um, and uh, the, the machine doesn't lie. It, it its ability to resolve certain factors, i.e. size, fluorescence, intensity, certain types of color, is actually better than we can store them and record them uh, in our eye and relate them onto, into data. So the, the variance, the, the distribution, the variability in the response of this is a lot tighter um, than people. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a very useful tool that way. Of course, we're always... Um, checking it with, uh, with the human eye by traditional microscopy side by side, and that's, that's how we built this library. We count size and identify um, with uh, the human eye on a, on a conventional ultraviolet microscope, and we compare that to what the Instascope reports in chamber studies, and that's how we built our reference library. Interesting. Cliff, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, thanks, guys. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke to uh, Jeff May. Some of you may or may not be uh, familiar with him. Uh, you know, pretty a really good uh, IQ guy and a uh, good microscopist. And one of the things that he said was that uh, in his um, slides that, that, that he's taken on sites, and I forget how many thousands of these things that he has in his collection. Uh, one of the things he said is that microscopists uh, in labs oftentimes will be fooled by things uh, that have color, such as pigments from photocopiers, uh, such as uh, pigments from paints and, and so on and so forth. And you mentioned colors, and I just wondered whether or not um, pigments from a photocopier or paint droplets, uh, you know, what would your, how would your system handle those? Well, um, there's a difference between color and fluorescence. Fluorescence is, is the emitted color that's perceived when you hit something with low wavelength light. I mean, uh, like ultraviolet light and, and you get, uh, and you get visible light back in a certain wavelength that we perceive as color. So that's one, one issue that's very different from picking up a pigment or uh, a piece of paint 
which doesn't fluoresce. Um, that, that's one property. We won't see those in, in an instascope because they don't have fluorescent properties. And the second is the, the size and shape. So um, biology has a very characteristic um, uh, morphology. That's the fancy word to get back to it. You know, it's, it's the size and shape of these particles. And that produces a certain reflection. And that's very different than what you'd see under an optical microscope in terms of size and shape. And yeah, it's, it's tough to count. There's a lot of other stuff in there. But if it doesn't fluoresce, it doesn't count it. It doesn't count it. That doesn't mean there aren't inter- any other interferences. And I'm sure we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, things that fluoresce in our biology are out there, but they fluoresce in a different way. Um, in any event, uh, to get back to the pigment and paint question, um, these things aren't fluorescent. So in this configuration of this instant microscope, which has three wavelengths of fluorescence, we probably wouldn't see those things. Okay, thanks. Um, let's go to, to Dr. Joe Boatman. Dr. Boatman, tell us a little bit about the, you know, what is what is the instrument telling us in a practical sense? Um, you're the one, I think, that goes out in the field and uses this, and, you know, you're, you're a field practitioner. How has it helped your, uh, your practice? Well, to, to answer that question, I have to briefly delve into the prior technology, the older technology, the one that everyone else is using at this point, uh, the small pumps with the uh, cassettes analyzed by a microscopist. I became very frustrated with that technology because many times I would collect samples. I would know, based on visual inspections, that I could that there was mold in a location. I could see it. I could smell the uh, metabolic gases but the cassette results would tell me that there wasn't any. And so it became very frustrating at times to use that technology. And as I delved into that more, I realized that there's a variety of problems with the technology that make it difficult sometimes for it to provide the right answer. You're collecting a very small sample. You're having it analyzed by a human being who may have had a bad weekend or may have had a great weekend, uh, or may have only uh, taken five minutes with a particular sample instead of half an hour. And so you get variable results, even when you take two samples right next to one another. In other words, you're trying to do science with a very blunt object, uh, that cassette and pump system. So I was actively hoping and looking for new technology that might make that system better or more reliable, or more accurate. And when I was presented with the opportunity to use this equipment, I discovered pretty quickly that it has some advantages. Uh, One advantage is that it looks at every particle that travels through it, through its detection chamber. And it, as Dr. Hernandez has said, it, it, uh, it puts every particle into a bin, uh, which is non-biological versus biological, and then if biological, what type of biology is it? Is it, is it a fungi? Is it, is it bacteria potentially? Is it uh, uh, one of those two or three things? And so you get information about that in real time, uh, which is the other part of the great advantage of it. You can take instead of, let's say, one outdoor sample and one indoor sample at a site, You can take multiple indoor samples at no extra cost. So at this point, I'm using that that new equipment to take samples of essentially every room in a building that I go into. I may take 10 samples. I may take 15 samples. And that way, I know whether a particular room has a problem, whereas others do not. And once I've discovered that a particular room has a problem, I can do additional sampling in that room to try to isolate where that problem is coming from. Hmm. So for me as a practitioner, it's a, it's a vast improvement in the sense that my job is to diagnose if there's a problem, and if so, what do we need to do to get that problem resolved? And to do my job then, first I need to find whether there's a problem or not, and second, I need to be able to tell people how to fix it, which means I need to discover the source for it. 
which is sometimes behind a wall, sometimes in carpet, sometimes above a ceiling, all of which you can't really see unless it's unless it's really quite bad and wet. Cliff. So the technology for me has really been an improvement in that respect. Okay, good. Cliff, let me turn it over to you. Yeah, I just have a follow-up question. Uh, you know, oftentimes indoor environmental professionals, when they're air sampling, you know, they may take what we call an aggressive sample. You know, they'll jump around the room or they get a spatula. You know, they pound the carpet. You know, sometimes people take leaf blowers and, you know, try to get a lot of stuff in the air. Do you do any type of aggressive uh, sampling with this system or feel that it would be necessary or advantageous? Well, this is Joe again. I will, I will say that I do that uh, occasionally in order to isolate a source for a problem. So, for instance, if carpet is a problem, I will do a sort of an aggressive sample by taking, a, collecting a, a, a sample with the Instascope while pounding on the carpet nearby to see if I can generate spores coming up out of that carpet. That's sort of an off-book uh, way of using the Instascope, but if you have the knowledge and understanding of what it's doing and how it works, uh, it's a very powerful tool to help you diagnose the source of problems. Oh, let me go. This is, but this is Matt. I was go just going to say, for when we instruct uh, inspectors with the Instascope, uh, what, what we basically tell them is that the Instascope is going to track a straight line and if you change the environment, you just need to know what you did. So if you create a synthetic environment, if you want to test what an environment looks like with uh, air filtration devices running, you can do that. And then you can turn them off. You can test an environment with the HVAC running and then with the HVAC off. And so uh, the real process is uh, not so much whether or not the Instascope uh, requires or can handle a certain sampling type. It's more does the practitioner uh, understand the uh, test environment that they've set up. And that's, that's really the only question when it comes to using the Instascope. But it, uh, it does allow you, per Joe's uh, uh, point, to uh, take as many samples as you want, which means you can create different environments and see how they, how they play out in real time. Thanks. Thanks. Let, me, let me get one more in here before we go to halftime. And I don't know if a uh, Matt or Dr. Hernandez would be we best to answer this. I'm assuming Matt would know how long of a sample. Um, you know, you're drawing air through a particle counter. What's what's the size? Um, how many liters of air, or you know, um, how long does you run it before it starts to count that particular sample? Uh, I'm going to break that question down a little bit. So, uh, just on the technical side, we're drawing right at about a liter a minute. Uh, the typical scan length goes anywhere from three minutes up to 20 minutes. Uh, but generally speaking, because we have a particle by particle resolution, it doesn't take a lot to get a good picture. Secondly, and then these things kind of stack together, um, because we're not a static sample, uh, that also changes what you're seeing. So instead of setting a pump in the middle of a room and drawing 150 liters of air or whatever you will from a static point, uh, we, we can move around. We do. We move around the room, and we move through the aerosol space, so we're looking at breathing zones for children and pets all the way up to adults standing and everything in between uh, throughout the entire space. So uh, we take that liter a minute, and then we have a distributed sample, and uh, we just instruct our inspectors that if they're not – creating some sort of synthetic environment, if they just want to get a picture of what folks are breathing, just to uh, really focus on having a, a well-mixed aerosol environment. And that's, that's it. Uh, Mark has something to say, too. I'd, I'd like to add to that, and that's one of the things that drove me to it as a research and practical tool. Um, and that is you, you get a time-integrated and space-integrated sample. This thing, it moves. And as we've mentioned, both Joe and Matt, it's... it's uh, it's not static in time either. It's not a grab sample. So you can get a composite sample of, of whatever environment or whatever lab chamber you have. And um, for me as a, a, both a researcher and a practitioner, um, th this is very important. And 
um, what we want to see are time integrated samples that approach the actual air exchange rate of whatever structure we're scanning. So um, that's how I've used it. We're actually doing a study in, in the Boulder Valley School District leveraging this, and we take uh, time integrated samples that approach, approach um, a significant fraction of the air exchange rate or whatever the exchange rate was designed to be. So this is a big step forward from um, the static sampling paradigm that we've used for years with, with basically um, cassettes that are at a single place and uh, have a limited runtime and are at, at risk for being o overloaded for microscopy. And Joe, just one more thing from a practical standpoint. Uh, I think Dr. Bowman can speak to this as well, but practically speaking, that means that we're testing a 2,500, 3,000 square foot house every room in 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, so that's how that kind of stacks up. I do have a follow-up for Dr. Boatman, but let me let me break here, folks, and uh, we're going to stop for 90 seconds and thank our sponsors. We'll be right back with uh, Dr. Hernandez, Dr. Boatman, and Matt Coghill. Uh, we're having an interesting discussion about uh, microbial or bioaerosol sampling with the Instascope and uh, comparing it to other methods. Very interesting. We'll be right back. And thanks to our newest sponsor, Particles Plus. Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers feature-rich particle counters, air quality monitoring instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. Learn more at www.particlesplus.com. Count on us. The Indoor Air Quality Association, a nonprofit, multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Visit them at iaqa.org. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions. We use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them at wolfsense.com. Legends Environmental Insurance Services, the experts in insurance for environmental consultants and contractors for over 20 years. Check them out at legends-enviro.com. And, of course, our marquee sponsors, John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. Clean Facts, the number one information source for cleaning and restoration professionals. Check them out at cleanfacts with an X, dot com. IAQ.net and Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at IAQ.net. Please be sure to thank our sponsors for their support of IAQ Radio when you acquire about their products. Services. Okay, we're back for the second half of our interview. We're uh, talking to Matt Coghill, Dr. Mark Hernandez, and Dr. Joe Boatman. And um, Joe, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question with, with respect to the practical aspects of this. When you're um, using the equipment, how, how, let me th how do I word it? How valuable is your past experience doing spore trap sampling, and how does that compare? To what you're getting now it seems like you're almost comparing apples and oranges well i would say that the the older technology spore trap system uh at best is is only seeing a a smaller percentage of the total particles that are there and that is entirely dependent upon the skill of the microscopist and of course the way the uh the person that's doing the sampling actually does it, uh, whereas the new technology sees every particle. So if the outdoor concentration with the old technology was 500 particles per cubic meter, the new technology might see 2,000 particles per cubic meter, a, a dramatic increase in number of particles because it sees every one, not just a portion of them. Uh, and to me, that is indicative of the, the, as I said before, the bluntness of the old technology. It's just partially blind to what's actually going on in the aerosol environment. Whereas the new technology uh, um, 
has had cataract surgery and now it can see really well. <laughs> so to me, that's, that's, that's a big, big plus. Uh, the answer to your question about using the old technology versus the new, I'm not saying the old technology has no value. I think people that use it can continue to use it, but they need to recognize that it's got shortcomings and that the new technology is, um, has less of those shortcomings. So um, to me, that's, that's an improvement and it's a better situation and, and deserves attention because of that. You know, Joe, this is Matt. I, we've been using a, an analogy that, that seems to work pretty well which is the, the current uh, sport trap technology is kind of like a film camera. It's film technology. And I think everybody's familiar with that in that you take a picture, you send it off to get developed, you pay for it to get developed, and then you find out what you got after the fact. Uh, and everybody knows how to use a film camera. Everybody can, you can use a film camera effectively with, with a certain amount of skill. Uh, the Instascope, on the other hand, is uh, a movie camera. Right? So you're not paying for film development. It's a digital movie camera. And so uh, you're getting real-time imaging, and uh, it, it gives you more uh, data and more pictures uh, to get a better idea of what's going on. And I think just to, one more point there, uh, when I talk to folks, you know, uh, especially dads, if you had a film camera, uh, you might take a couple pictures of Thanksgiving, a couple, couple pictures of Christmas, uh, but that's all you did. Once it was easy to take a picture or a video on your phone, it wasn't just a change in the technology. It was a change in how you thought about pictures. And I think that's what we're seeing in users today is uh, they're thinking in new ways about how to assess indoor environmental quality because they've got a technology that allows them to think in a new way and act in a new way and do a better job. Okay. I've got to get to some text questions coming in from listeners. I'm going to go back to the beginning. The first one is... I, I think I know the answer, but I may be surprised. Um, one of you mentioned uh, mold odors. It might have been um, Joe, Dr. Boatman there, and uh, that those are gases, and, and you can detect them you know, by smell, obviously. Does, does the equipment detect any kind of VOC activity? Is that something outside of the capabilities? Yeah, this is Matt. Um, I think we all know that uh, MVOCs are really hard to measure on the fly. They're in such small concentrations. So we're, uh, we're uh, microbial V, uh, volatile organic compounds. And um, uh, I think the simplest way to answer that is we're the particle guys. We're looking for particles. Okay. Uh, and specifically how many and then who. That's what I assumed, but I wanted to make sure I asked the question. Now, the next one is um, somebody went on your website and they saw that when airborne levels of mold get too high, it indicates a problem that can have serious consequences. What is too high according to Insta, Insta, Instascope? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and what I can tell you is uh, we look for statistical outliers, I guess is the geeky way to say it. Too high means... Uh, what I'm trying to do is say this without getting into our algorithm too deep, but essentially what we're looking for is bioaerosol loads that are either way more in concentration or way different in ecological composition than the other samples that we took. So it's not just a pure outdoor to indoor comparison. We also compare uh, all the rooms to each other. We compare the rooms to a national statistical database, uh, which is something I'll have Mark talk about more. Uh, rank order distribution stuff a la Joe Spurgeon, if you guys are familiar with some of his work. Uh, and there's a whole lot more going on there, but it all boils down to, is this sample, this room, way more or way different than the other samples? And let's let's go to Dr. Hernandez. Mark, tell us a little bit about the you know national averages and, and some of the background information on what is normal, what is what is elevated, what is high. Well, that's a good question, and um, probably a lot of the practitioners that are listening right now understand that normal depends on where you are. Um, so normal um, aerobiology loads in, in the southeast are very different than where we are here at high and dry in Boulder, Colorado, where there's very little humidity most of the year, um, and uh, we're at a, a, a very high altitude and have a lot of UV flux. So um, 
the first cut on that is it depends on where you are. What's, what's nice about this tool is you can, um, you can reference it to location, and that's my interest as an as a, um, atmospheric scientist and uh, practicing engineer is how we can look at the database of all the observations that we have, and there are thousands of them, and at each, uh, in each metropolitan area, for instance, not each, but many metropolitan areas, we have a, a database that's unique to the region and to, say, um, the age of the structure, what type of structure it is. We, we, we've got that kind of information which scientists call metadata. I don't know why we call it that, but we're kind of stuck with that title. In any event, um, we, can, we can look at this national database in the context of where we are and pick um, building factors out of that that are common. And then we can, we can plant a flag and, and define normal. Um, the best analogy I can give you for this is uh, those of us that have kids, um, we go to the doctor and we, we, uh, when our children are born, as they grow, they have a growth chart and there are percentiles. And so uh, my son, for instance, is in the 70th percentile of growth for his age and so on. Um, and that tells me how far he is from the average the percentile of the average is 50. Um, and we can relate this to the database of observations that we have. So if I have a, a room within a house uh, in a certain area that's in the 90th percentile of load, that is, it has um, airborne uh, biology loads as judged by the Instascope in a, in a time and space scan that are greater than 90% of all the other ones that I've seen, that's an outlier to me. And that's very different than uh, the paradigm that we use nowadays for indoor-outdoor comparisons that are local um, because it allows us to, to compare a single site to a cohort of other sites um, with lots of observations. And what's great about this is it gets smarter. The more observations we have, the better the database gets, the more accurate our percentile judgments become, and we can, we can uh, relate that to a certain area or a certain building housing type or even down to what's the carpet in there houses of a certain age with a certain carpet in a certain metro area. We can get that tight, and that's where this database is going. And my interest as a, as a public health scientist and engineer is to leverage that data for the specific context, because we know all our houses are different. Um, the building practices, the uh, ventilation practices, the age of structures of our building stock is really uh, different in different parts of our country. So that's where we're going with the database, and this, this ratio of Aerobiological load to total particles is going to help us get there. Um, and what's great about this is in the age of big data, we have cell phones that send data. So does the Instascope. It sends it to the cloud, and we can mine that for information. Um, and it just gets smarter and better. And, Joe, practically, if folks are on the site, that looks like uh, green, yellow, and red is the second level of information that comes out of the Instascope. You get a raw count. Uh, I'm sorry, a calculated count. Uh, and then you also get green, yellow, and red, which is essentially saying uh, in the normal distribution, green, yellow, different, red, very different, either in concentration or composition. I'm, I'm curious, going back to the early days of the Instascope, um, what, did, did you collect data from things like the AAAAI's National Allergy Bureau readings and then maybe like I know MLab, P and K and other labs, they have their database of what, you know, what sample results look like in different parts of the country. And then maybe, uh, is, that, is that how you got started out or is it all your own information that you've gathered over the years? Uh, Joe, this is Mark Hernandez again. And in the, the early days, um, we did what caveman do in, in the laboratory. And we did just what you suggested. We looked at all these databases from classical or conventional microscopists and made a rank order of what are the most common um, airborne fungi in water damage structures? What are the most common airborne fungi, fungi outdoors in the various different uh, geographical regions in the U.S.? And we, um, we got those cultures, brought them into the lab, grew them up, aged them, and made them form spores. And each pure culture we aerosolized in a chamber, and we got the, the optical signatures back and created a library of more than 50 of them. So we kind of did this brute force, and we compared the counts on good old aerosol cassettes with a microscopist against 
what we aerosolized in the chamber, and guess what? They lined up almost perfectly. <laughs> Not only did we do that, we went into the field here in Colorado and other parts of the country and compared microscopist's results with what the Instascope was reporting, and we found very good agreement with that in general. So um, uh, to answer your question, um, we did it the hard way um, with a good old light microscope and a chamber and uh, cultures of the stuff that we believe are the most commonly occurring both outdoors and in water damaged environments. And that, that's how it was born. And up to now, I think we're about, we have about 55 different cultures and that's ever expanding of both bacteria, pollen, um, and different types of fungi from not only the U.S. but all over the world. Now, I'm, I'm sure you're uh, all familiar with um, Dr. Vesper and the Ermi, and and that's looking at dust. I'm wondering if you're you're, and, and I know Matt, you mentioned um, Dr. Joe Spurgeon, and and Joe's been a guest on the show, a friend of the show, and uh, I'm glad to hear you're working with him as well because he's, I believe, he's doing some things that have needed done for years, and uh, I'm really happy to hear that that you're all working together. Any thoughts on, on somehow working together with dust sample uh, collection and results and somehow combining and comparing those with your air sampling results? You know, Joe, it's, it's interesting. I think um, at this time, we haven't made that initiative, but I think part of what we're interested in in that that big data mindset is correlating uh, instascope results to uh, DNA results with uh, you know uh, qualitative PCR or uh, correlating it to a dust sample or correlating it to uh, visual observation uh, that uses additional tools. For instance, we're uh, pushing forward uh, in the visual notes section of the iPad to say if you see signs of water damage, uh, then take a moisture meter reading in this circumference of the, of the visible damage and correlate that moisture information with the temperature and the relative humidity and anything else you want back to this data. And I think, the, you know, if I know anything about uh, the science guys on my team, uh, they'll always take more data, always. And what it does is just gives us a sharper and sharper picture uh, of, of what's going on um, both for the immediate context of addressing restoration, remediation, water loss projects like most guys, you know, make their living doing, uh, and also for uh, guys like uh, Mark looking at broader uh, public health initiatives, um, which is really interesting. Uh, I won't go too far down that rabbit hole, but we're even talking to folks about correlating Instascope uh, information back to epidemiological information. Um, which starts to get real interesting. Well, you, you anticipated two questions there. Uh, one was correlation with visible mold. Um, another was visible, you know, correlation with health um, epidemiology and, and health effects, because those are areas that we've, you know, we've always had a little, uh, in my in my experience, a lack of information on. I guess um, the third would be, and I want to address this to either Dr. Hernandez or to uh, Dr. Boatman, how does this correlate with definitions of dampness? Because dampness, in my experience, is all over the board. How do, we, how do you define dampness, if you do, um, with respect to the technology you're working on? Well, this is, uh, this is Joe Boatman. Uh, from a practical point of view, when I when I go into a building, yes, I look for dampness using moisture detection equipment and infrared sensors. Uh, if I find dampness in an isolated location, of course, I'm going to be looking for mold growth in and around that location with the instascope, and I'm going to be looking for a source for the dampness, as as the other practitioner people would would be as well, doing the same kinds of things. So in, if you're looking for the answer in terms of an absolute magnitude of dampness, I'm not sure I have that answer for you. Um, it, it's more of the, it, it's more relative to 
the conditions around that area of dampness. Is it slightly more damp? Is it extremely wet? You know, that kind of thing. But any dampness, even high humidity in some situations, is a precursor for mold growth. And that's kind of where I was headed with respect to the humidity. And I don't know, if Dr. Hernandez, how much you've done with respect to, you know, what what are the conditions when we're dealing with just elevated humidity versus an actual, you know, liquid water leak? I mean, any any comments from your side of the research end of things? Yeah, a, a lot of my work over the last generation is actually focused on the effects of humidity on the survival of microbes in the aerosol phase. Um, back to your your question about dust is dust comes from the air. That's that's where we get it. And um, the ways that we operate our residences and buildings in a lot of cases is, is we turn them into big settling plates. Um, what the the power of Insiscope here is we can get, uh, as Matt mentioned, a movie of the aerobiological load and total particle load. And with a little bit of engineering calculations, we can figure out how much of that's going to end up in dust and then correlate it. Uh, uh, take a look at the dust as, as a long-term sampler and compare it to our time-integrated samplers and, and see what we get. That obviously is very complicated by humidity and differences in the humidities between indoors and outdoors in different parts of the country. Um, and, and I think we all agree high humidity inside where water shouldn't be is not good regardless of the source. Um, but where the Instascope comes into play here is if we do encounter water where it shouldn't be, it helps us diagnose if that damage has translated into microbes in the aerosol phase in a in an abundance or ecology of what not of what not would not be otherwise normal. So it helps us helps us diagnose if humidity or water has done the damage to the structure that produces the aerobiology that's not desirable. To get on to the the second part, um, measuring the health effect of that in mass is, is tougher. But the data that we get from this can only help epidemiologists do their job and correlate either humidity itself or the aerobiological load associated with undesirable health effects. Yeah. And, Joe, I think, you know, practically, this is Matt, for us, what I, what I teach guys, and I know I'm dumbing it down a lot here, but I say if you have a high bioaerosol load, it's because it's either dirty or wet, Right. Dirty, S520, condition two, solid spores, wet, condition three, active, actual growth. Um, and so practically for uh, practitioners, they're looking for high bioaerosol loads, and then they're looking for an indoor source. And that's almost always going to start with a moisture investigation. And if you can't find moisture, you're going to be looking for uh, settled spores. And then if none of those produce an answer, you have to start going down the rabbit hole of chasing other potential drivers, right? But Practically, uh, this tool uh, is used by practitioners. Not, it's used by practitioners and researchers, but it's it's made for everyday use by guys who make their living finding indoor sources and fixing them. And this is Mark Fernandez again. Back to your comment about Dr. Vesper's um, uh, QPCR suite. We actually used that um, in the early days of this as the representative types of fungi um, to build the library to which Instascope is now referenced for optical data. So we used, uh, we used the list um, for the, the uh, major, er actually all the ERMI players are uh, included in the list to build the library to which this is referenced, and then um, extended Dr. Spurgeon's practical use of probability distribution, i.e. percentiles and outliers that he's done with aspergillus and penicillium um, with conventional microscopy, uh, we, we extended that idea to use that now with um, the optical library, the fluorescence characteristics of the database um, that's being built with the Instascope observations all over the country, of which there are many thousands now. I think we're up above how many? Oh, gosh. We're north of 70, 80,000 observations. That means individual room scans. So that's quite a big database. And it, it gives you a nice end to work with from a, a scientific perspective as well as an epidemiologic perspective. Cliff, before we go to Roundup, do you have any follow-up on that? Um, no, I'd like to, I guess my question, how many of these machines are actually out in the field and how do you market them? And 
Well, we go on IAQ Radio. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> you get the IAQ yeah. Radio bump. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's what we do. So uh, at the moment, we've got uh, just south of 50 units uh, out in the field. Uh, at this stage of the game, uh, we're really looking for uh, folks who want to embrace next generation technology and uh, make that step from film cameras to movie cameras. So at this point, because we're a disruptive technology, it, it really starts with a conversation and a little bit of time uh, having guys get their head wrapped around, well, I've used a film camera for 40 years. Uh, what is this thing? Uh, and uh, that's it's really been uh, a uh, one-at-a-time conversation uh, with folks. But what we're starting to see in terms of uh, marketing and folks getting their hands on this unit is uh, guys like Dr. Boatman use it, and then I get calls from five other IEPs in the state of Colorado saying, I saw this thing, how do I get one? And that's we're starting to see that, that happen. Uh, as people start to realize that this technology exists and it's available to uh, practitioners in the field today. And, and do you, are these machines sold or leased or how do you do that? Yeah, we, we um, sell the units uh, directly from Detection Tech. We build them here in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And uh, that's, that's uh, if, if folks are interested, they can contact uh, us through the contact link on the, uh, on the site, and uh, you'll go straight to my my phone, and we can start the conversation. Great, thanks. Let's uh, let's go to the roundup, John. Move him on, hit him up, hit him up. Move him on, move him on, hit him up, raw high. Cut him out, ride him in, ride him in, let him out, cut him out, ride him in, raw. All right, we're running a little low on time, but I, I've got a, a list of questions. We may have to just do a follow-up on this, but um, I guess let me start with this this one, that, and then I'll, I'll do one, Cliff, then you do one, and then I'll finish up if you don't mind. Okay. What about um, one of you mentioned, I can't remember, I think it was Dr. Boatman, Joe, you mentioned um, – a lot of times mold is, is hidden. You don't you don't necessarily see it. I looked at a couple of uh, condominiums yesterday that, you know, they were. I, I've been around long enough to know when they're covering things up. Um, what kind of what kind of um, twist on this are you looking at? Maybe for wall cavity sampling, it, or is that not even necessary? Are you finding that you're picking up and and identifying areas that have you know, hidden mold, people paint over it, it's in a wall cavity, it's not showing on the other side. Are you looking at maybe putting a sample, uh, a connection on there that can go into a wall cavity, or do you not think that's necessary based on your field experience to this point? Well, my experience has been that many times you can see with the Instascope behind a wall by removing a, an electrical plate or by uh, pulling a baseboard back and tapping on the wall or pounding on the wall while you're taking a sample. So you don't have to do anything intrusive. But there are times when uh, poking a small hole in the wall might be a big advantage, and you can then take a sample from inside the wall using the Instascope. Uh, but I will say that the Instascope is not perfect in the sense that it can't see behind, above, below things uh, all the time. So there's still a, there's still the possibility that you'd miss something if it was hidden, intentionally or otherwise. But I think it does a much better job than the spore trap technology, simply because you can take multiple samples. And I guess that you're seeing more in each sample, um, which which leads me to think that maybe. Um, maybe you would pick things up that way as opposed to, you know, uh, as opposed to trying to get air out of the wall. And somebody just noted here, there wouldn't be a whole lot of, uh, you wouldn't have a whole lot of suction coming out of that. Well, I guess you wouldn't need too much though. What would you do? Put the, the probe right next to the hole in the wall? Well, so this is Matt, you know, we've, we've done that. I think, uh, the, the principle, really what you're talking about is a question of practice, right? How do you effectively access 
aerosol inside of a wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's, you know, there's lots of challenges there, right, with the, you know, the insulation and the, all that stuff. But what I can tell you is, uh, in practice, we use the Instascope uh, to see if we can get a reading from behind the wall if we need to. Uh, and we can find out right then and there if we're getting good data. Uh, we don't have to wait uh, for the results. So um, part of what that means is if you really want to go down that road, uh, you can you can go hunting uh, uh, and check each cavity if you if you really wanted to. But uh, in practice, I don't think that's what we ever see happening. You know, we're we primarily focus on being an indoor exposure tool. We're most interested in what the occupants are exposed to, uh, and then. From there, uh, you know, diagnosing the structure, there are other tools we have in our back pocket, right? Moisture meters and thermal cameras and other common tools that help us get to the heart of the issue. Cliff, go ahead. I've got kind of a curveball for you. Uh, A lot of people that are in disaster restoration not only deal with water damage, but they also deal with, with fire damage. And I'm wondering, um, it would seem to me that this machine uh, would have uses for, um, you know, sampling after a fire, you know, in a home or dealing with, you know, wildfire residues and and, and so on and so forth. Can you comment on that? Absolutely, Cliff. You know, when we were developing the instrument uh, at a a previous group, we also produced a whole range of uh, instruments that were designed for uh, measuring black carbon in the atmosphere, and that's, you know, the carbon loads are what you're looking at post-fire. Right. So, um, that's um, not what this instrument is designed to do. We used a whole range of really sophisticated and really expensive technologies to do that <laughs> for the research community. Um, and so for this, we were trying to produce an instrument that was more accessible to folks. Now, what I will say is you touched on something interesting, which is uh, in the water mitigation space, we've used this tool to characterize homes day over day during a water loss in terms of bioaerosol loading. And that has produced some stunning, uh, concerning results uh, that are really pretty intuitive. And uh, even the S-500 speaks to them that says, you know, uh, air-moving devices inherently tend to aerosolize soils and other contaminants. And what I can tell you is when you do real-time testing with Instascope on a water loss day over day, even hour over hour, uh, we can confirm that uh, in a big way. And I think for us, it's an exciting space to say we can uh, potentially bring uh, better processes to the water mitigation space uh, and justification, because if you're using traditional sampling, typically speaking, by the time you get the sample back, you're off the job. Whereas with Instascope, you can change the way that you're managing a, a loss or a remediation. Uh, you can You can change your management processes in relationship to measurement in real time. Go ahead, you know, I, I just, got, just a quick follow-up. You know, one of the things that's concerned me uh, about some of the, the, the current processes, I go way back with water damage restoration back to the you know, mid-70s when Lloyd Weaver, who was a, a really good personal friend of mine, you know, developed on location water damage and, 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 and drying. And what he used to do is float carpet. They would put the air movement equipment underneath and float the carpet. And they've kind of moved away from that and done what they call in place drying. And I'm way more concerned about uh, particulate getting in the air in these situations. And it would seem to me that if you're finding it and you know red lights are, are kind of going off, I'm just wondering whether you've done anything comparatively versus, uh, you know, in place or top down drawing versus this, the way we used to do it with the floor. You know, we, we have, and we, uh, essentially what we found, not to go over time too much here, but essentially what we found is that, uh, structures behave differently, uh, every single one. We, we weren't able to find a trend, uh, from one process to the other. Uh, and essentially what we uh, came to is that uh, if you want to not just manage the materials as part of a water loss, getting stuff dry, but you want to manage the environment, you need to measure the environment like you measure moisture in the materials uh, as part of your process. Uh, and 
change how you're approaching that loss uh, day over day, which is the whole reason we have drying inspections and all that is to see. You don't just say, hey, I put some fans in here. It'll be dry in three days. I'll come back three days later. You have drying inspections, and you say, is it more dry today than it was yesterday? We're taking that same principle uh, in indoor environmental process and saying, uh, is the environment uh, better or worse as we're uh, taking care of this, uh, this loss site day over day, and what do we need to do in real time to manage it better for uh, the structure and for, more importantly, the occupants? Let me let me Thank finish you. this with another. I, I've got two quick questions. One, what would you like to see the equipment do better? So, what are what are some of the flaws? I mean, you know, we might as well get out there and and tell folks, okay, here's what here's what you can expect to run into that you may or may not you know you may not be real thrilled about. And secondly. Um, what are you planning on trying to get the equipment to do in the future that it doesn't do now? I guess they're sort of related. So uh, I can speak to that. You know, for us, uh, the raw number count, we're very, very happy with in terms of the numbers it produces. We are uh, trying to continue to extend the uh, what we would call the decision logic, the green, yellow, red, and make it tighter and tighter and tighter. So as Mark uh, spoke uh earlier as we get more data um, right now the green yellow red I think what I can say is in the center of the bell curve it's really solid when you get out to the tails these outlier environments uh, you'll see weird stuff um, you know one off it's it's when that you know 90th percentile weird environment that you come across once a year uh, we want to nail that one too with the green yellow red and so the more data we get, the tighter the green, yellow, red information gets. Uh, so we really, we really want to continue to extend that. So that both speaks to uh, what's not perfect about the Instascope right now. It's not as smart as it's become. Uh, what do we want it to do? We want it to get smarter. Uh, and also, uh, we are uh, planning to release uh, uh, airborne bacteria and pollen uh, measurements. We can do it right now, uh, but the challenge is not so much whether or not we can produce the data, but whether we can give the data context and meaning. Because for most IEPs, if we gave them an airborne bacterial load, that's a number they've got to explain and have a context for. And with an absence of TLVs and all that, we've really got to have a robust uh, uh, rank order distribution or some other kind of context that says, what does that bacterial or pollen information actually mean? I guess red, yellow, green, it, it's very simple, but on the other hand, is it is it too simple? Have you thought about maybe a, a five-level, you know, uh, reporting or, you know, sort of like the Homeland Security, you know, the, you, you get red level green, it seems like, yeah, maybe we could go to the next level. Maybe there's maybe there's five levels. Have, has that ever come up? Absolutely, it has, Joe. And I think uh, for us, what we're really trying to do is n produce an instrument that a high-level guy like Dr. Boatman can use, but he can hand a report to the end customer that they understand mm -hmm. right off the bat. So for us, coming out of the scientific atmospheric world, I, we can produce data uh, at a level of granularity that will make your head spin, right? And so the issue has been, how do we make this accessible to the end customer so that Mrs. Jones understands it? And we're, uh, we're still open to any conversation, but ultimately what we find is that, uh, you know, customers are afraid uh, and they're confused and they're in deep water. And we really want to make it as accessible as possible. Gotcha. And you know, also, you know, Joe, as a researcher and a practitioner, um, you know what we what we strive for is: do I have a significant difference or not? And that's the difference between green and red. Stop or go. And as often happens in science, there's an indeterminate area in between. We can we can see a trend or we can see a difference, but we can't tell if it's significant. That's yellow. So. Um, frankly, I like what these colors represent as a researcher, and um, it's it's what we eventually need to get to to make a decision. Is it different or isn't it? And then there's 
as you suggested, shades in between, or as Matt said, we can, we can pull out any granularity we want because we've got the data. But um, that may or may not be useful, particularly in the marketplace or in the lab. Um, so uh, as a researcher, I really like this three-tiered system. Um, I think it's helpful and speaks to what it is. Yeah, and Joe, just one last thing. You know, uh, when I do the training uh, for inspectors with InstaScope, the real challenge is I, I can train guys on how to effectively use the instrument in the space in about 30 minutes flat. But uh, what we spend the majority of our time working on is uh, understanding uh, really building physics and aerobiology and uh, sort of how do I put green, yellow, and red in context, not how do I get more data out of green, yellow, and red. That's really where we spend most of our time focused. Interesting. Gentlemen, before we go, is there anything we missed that you'd like to add or any final thoughts? Well, Joe, the only thing I would add is this, that we uh, we built the website, detectiontech.com, as a sandbox to see if we could make uh, this tool make sense to the end customer. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, technical information that's designed for the sort of folks that would listen to this show, and what I would say is if folks want to access that information, uh, they should just contact me directly um, either via the website or I'm sure you've got my email in there, uh, and we can get you the, the deeper dive on this. We'll get uh, Cliff to put your email in the blog. Yeah. And if you want to give people it now, that would be fine too, Matt. That's, that's fine. Uh, you can just contact us at info, I-N-F-O, at detection tech, detection d e t e c t i o n tech t e k dot com Very because t e p h was taken. <laughs> <laughs> Understood, gentlemen. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this week. It's been uh, really interesting, and uh, I look forward to you know doing more with with you in the future. Uh, Cliff and I do a conference in the fall. I'm going to talk to you about maybe popping out for that i know joe spurgeon will be up here and uh, a few other people i'm sure you wouldn't mind talking to this is radio joe hughes saying thank you to this week's guests dr mark hernandez dr joe boatman and matt coghill the detection tech team we'll be back next friday oh by the way next friday we've got greg long and um, we're going to talk a little bit about mechanical systems cleaning and uh, talk a little bit more about a new product he's been using and and discuss i think we're going to focus mostly on coil cleaning cliff is that the your recollection on it i think so that that and and the uh technology and the products very good well this is radio joe saying thanks again to this week's guest thank you john good job uh my engineer john you gotta have faith no glitches of course the z-man cliff slotnik as always great to work with you most importantly our growing group of loyal listeners please come back next friday at noon for the next broadcast of iaq radio This has been another IAQ Radio production. 